gets used in the legislative debate and what might be done out of a project like this to improve the quality of the evidence that would be treated as relevant evidence and important evidence by policymakers and lawyers in the legal system. So take it away. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, I'd like to actually t uh, take a bit of a broader approach to your um, interest in legislative debates because what we've seen in Canada since the turn of the century is a very complex and nonlinear relationship between court decisions, uh, legislative policy, academic scholarship, and advocacy activities, and they're fundamentally intertwined. Uh, in 2012, Canada passed the Copyright Modernization Act, which was a very long time, more than a decade in the making. And we see in the Copyright, Copyright Modernization Act an emphasis on the principle of balance. Um, and that emphasis on the balance between copyrights and users' rights is entrenched in the legislation because of what the Supreme Court of Canada had done uh, in, a, in a series of cases the decade before the legislation was enacted. So actually I'll just take you back very briefly to the start of the 21st century and a book published by uh, David Vaver who is a law professor who's taught in Canada and New Zealand and Oxford and he wrote a book uh, called Copyright Law in Canada and he had an entire chapter in that book called Users Rights and the foreword to that book was written by the Chief Justice of Canada, Beverly McLaughlin. And it was only four years after the publication of David Vaver's book with a chapter called User's Rights, that in a case called CCH in the Law Society of Upper Canada, the Chief Justice wrote in her decision that, quote, user rights are not just loopholes. And that was a real turning point in Canadian uh, policy toward copyright limitations and exceptions. And we see that coming directly from the academic scholarship. Now, it wasn't economic scholarship, it was legal scholarship, but the, there's a real opportunity for economics to inform uh, court decisions and, and jurisprudence, and that will in turn inform uh, legislative policy. If you look at some of the other cases that were decided around the same time, there's actually a series of three cases between 2002 and 2004 known as the Supreme Court of Canada's Copyright Trilogy. And one of those, uh, the cornerstone of that trilogy, I think, is the CCH case where it was unequivocally stated that copyright uh, user rights, limitations and exceptions are not just loopholes. Uh, another is the case of um, uh, Taberge where the court was very clear about the economic uh, issues before, uh, before it. And it, it said that it would be, it said in crassly economic terms, it would be as inefficient to overcompensate rights holders as it would be self-defeating to undercompensate them. But it didn't go into any more detail about how the court might strike that balance between over or undercompensation. If you fast forward to 2012, um, it was a, another a big year in, in Canadian jurisprudence. In addition to the, the statutory reforms in the Copyright Modernization Act, we have five Supreme Court of Canada cases known as uh, the Quintet or the Pentology. And two of these cases directly concern the interpretation of fair dealing. And in that context, we saw the court place heavy reliance on economic evidence, or in these particular cases, the absence of economic evidence. One of the cases uh, concerned the, the f uh, fair dealing in schools and whether photocopying short excerpts of case books or textbooks and circulating those to students was a fair dealing or not. And the copyright collective that was arguing this was not fair dealing cited the fact that textbook sales had declined 20, uh, uh, by a significant percentage in the past 20 years, but didn't provide any evidence to back that up. And the Supreme Court rejected the argument that that was sufficient to say it wasn't fair dealing. They, were, um, they didn't call for uh, specific evidence to support the fairness of the dealing, but what's going to happen now is um, rights holders are, are, are sure to submit better evidence. The court has basically given them a, a road map to demonstrate adverse economic impacts in order to defeat an argument of fair dealing to narrow the scope of users' rights. And so I think there's actually a real opportunity for uh, independent uh, scholars and independent researchers to help provide evidence not to suggest that, um, that users' rights uh, don't have an adverse economic impact on rights holders. That, that may be the case, and the Supreme Court's already accepted that in the Alberta 
an access copyright case, but rather to demonstrate the positive impacts that user rights may have. And I think that's where a real opportunity lies. And if we can do that and get uh, the courts to start accepting this, we'll see a, a, a loop where judicial policy and legislative policy are intertwined with each other. Great. Thank you. Rebecca? And please speak into the mics, guys, because we're on the web. So I'm here because finally something is happening in copyright in Australia. Uh, we have got an inquiry. The Australian Law Reform Commission was asked to inquire into the adequacy and the appropriateness of the existing exceptions and statutory licenses that we've got in the Australian copyright law. Uh, there have been almost 900 submissions so far in response to this. It's, the final report is going to be due in November, but 868 submissions as of Monday arguing the pros and cons of introducing, largely focusing on introducing more flexible exceptions, but also how do we deal with uh, user rights when it comes to education, people with disability, and across the entire spectrum. Um, the, uh, the Law Reform Commission indicated at the most recent uh, stage that it was inclined to introduce broader exceptions. It was inclined to reduce the possibility of contracting out of those exceptions. And it was also uh, very much inclined to introduce a flexible exception like US style fair use. And there's been a lot of pushback against that by right holders who have been arguing it will be too uncertain, that it will be contrary to Australia's international obligations under the three-step test. Uh, and that it means less works will be created. So I'm here today in my capacity as an academic, but I'm also a board director for the Australian Digital Alliance, which is a coalition of uh, innovators and users uh, who seek to advocate for uh, the development of law that's in the public interest, so balanced copyright law. So uh, my views are informed by that as well. Now in terms of the formal evidence that's been provided in all of these submissions, uh, I want to focus not just on the economic evidence, but also kind of the lack of economic evidence, the other kinds of evidence that are being put forward, because really there's very little economic evidence that's been used to support the arguments either for or against flexible exceptions. Uh, the, the main study that's been done in, in Australia uh, was by lateral economics that Yost uh, referred to that was commissioned by the ADA to try and um, quantify in a useful way the value of flexible exceptions. And uh, they came to uh, the view that uh, it would add about up to $600 million per annum to the in productivity gains uh, if we did introduce flexible exceptions. And those reports were at least helpful in opening the eyes of policymakers and regulators to the possibility that maybe people advocating for flexible exceptions weren't just trying to free ride on the works of others, but maybe there was more to it than that. Uh, but the other evidence tended not to be uh, so focused on economic evidence. It was largely focused on like the, the practical ridiculousness of the current law in many cases. So lots of real life examples of the things that you can't do under Australian law uh, that you really should be able to do. So for example, if you're a library, you can make quite extensive scans of, of print works for disabled users, but you have to destroy it after each single time. So even if you know that someone else is going to need it next week, you've got to destroy it and then you've got to scan it again for them. So there's a lot of real inefficiencies, a lot of high transaction costs for the, the institutions that are least able to bear them. Um, so providing a lot of these real life examples, you know, letting people know the fact that if you forward an email, that's a copyright infringement, things like that uh, were quite helpful. Uh, when it came to the evidence against fair use, I think what got the most widespread attention were the submissions from the Kernikan Center at Columbia Law School, which I'm sure some of you in this room uh, have read. And that submission referred to a lot of uh, US treatises and cases to support the idea that uh, fair use is inherently uncertain. Now, the, the submissions in favor of fair use referred to a lot of work by US scholars, Yazi, uh, Samuelson, Beebe, SAG, uh, which got a lot of traction within the ALRC. The Kernikan submissions tried to counteract that and suggested that the ALRC had put too much weight on those submissions. Um, and it, it really emphasized uh, those fair use guidelines that had been negotiated in the 70s and 80s by right holders. 
Um, there has been a response to this um, by Yazi, Hins, and SAG that's been circulated, but I suspect that the Kernikan submission has been circulated much more widely uh, than that. What's really notable is um, there really was no empirical economic evidence supplied in support of this argument that less works would be made if flexible exceptions were introduced. And that's not going to be a surprise to you after listening to Christian's presentation, which really suggested, well, maybe that's because there isn't any. Um, so what more evidence is needed? In terms of the, the further economic evidence that would be really helpful, we would benefit from uh, stronger evidence linking flexible exceptions to economic growth, of course. Um, studies considering whether flexible exceptions help or hinder different kinds of creators and in different circumstances. The extent to which purpose-based exceptions might generate those wasteful transaction costs, uh, if we could quantify those and measure those, it could be really useful. Um, and of course, Yost is right that you can't interview companies that don't exist, um, but maybe we could look at companies that go to innovation hubs like Silicon Valley from other jurisdictions, other countries, and try and measure the extent to which the lack of flexible exceptions influence them um, in, in making those choices. So I know in Australia, if you, if you uh, are an innovator doing a tech startup, the first thing you do is fly to San Francisco. Um, so yeah, so uh, that's, that's really what I wanted to say. Um, I, I think one of the big problems there is part of the Australian process is that we've got some evidence, we've got uh, lots, of, uh, lots of illustrations about why uh, the Australian system is ridiculous. I mean, an Australian library is allowed to copy a work to, to, uh, to get a, a replacement copy after it's been lost or stolen. But not until after it's been lost or stolen. <laughs> um, so we've, look, we've got evidence about the ridiculousness of the law. Uh, the trouble we are having is really getting the message out, getting people to care, getting them to understand that this is something that they should be uh, um, lobbying their politicians about. Thanks. Thank you. Carol. All right, listening to Jeremy and Rebecca, I'm quite envious because South Africa is in a very different position. So just to think about the Canadian situation, first of all, where there's a lot of case law and jurisprudence on this, um, South Africa is sadly lacking. Um, there are no cases at all on exceptions and limitations. So the courts do not even have the opportunity to engage with economic empirical research. And then moving along to Rebecca's account of what's going on in Australia where they've got um, a copyright reform process in motion and you've had almost 900 um, submissions, well, we are kilometers behind. Um, South Africa has just published a draft um, national IP policy. It's not copyright specific. It covers all aspects of IP. Um, it does speak about copyright, but in a very superficial manner. So it makes the right noises about the need to have meaningful exceptions and limitations. Um, it doesn't say too much. Um, it cites no economic evidence whatsoever. And really this is important because this is where we are. There hasn't yet been um, meaningful discourse. So what the government has done is put down what its position is and almost just throw the gamut open to everybody else to, to comment. So it's quite disappointing that um, there's very little economic empirical evidence that has been relied on by the relevant government department. Um, they do cite one paper entitled um, Copyright um, Exceptions, Limitations, and Learning Materials. Um, that leads to one of my major gripes. Um, this document is not publicly available. That means that anyone who wants to engage with that evidence is, is on a back foot. You, you can't interrogate evidence that you haven't seen. So I suppose um, the one thing I would like to say about South Africa is um, the very limited economic empirical research that is cited should be made publicly available. Um, in searching for um, that particular paper that is cited, which I could not find, I found another paper um, written by the same author, um, Professor Porris um, from the University of Pretoria, and this is one of those papers that you spoke about, those papers that talk about the economic contribution of copyright-based industries, right? So South Africa has done one of those studies. Um, we've already heard earlier on today that that's not particularly useful. Um, but still, I think it should have been put there, at least in the policy, so we know where to start from. Um, beyond that, there's been no other economic study of um, copyright that I know of in South Africa. There was a study carried out two years ago um, 
a WIPO publication came out of that. It's called The Economics of IP in South Africa. Um, it does not address, address copyright at all um, in any meaningful fashion. And so really I suppose the takeaway from me is that we obviously need some economic empirical research done in South Africa. Um, once that's available, that needs to be widely disseminated and then we can start to engage um, with the merits or demerits of what it says. Um, essentially, for now, that's my first spill. I'm hoping to get a second chance um, to share a bit more with you. Well, as far as the European Union is concerned, there are initiatives aiming at a more flexible framework of exceptions and limitations in several member states. I think uh, a well-known example is the United Kingdom, where the debate on flexible lawmaking in that area starts with the Hargreaves reports and so on. Um, we have similar initiatives in Ireland, the Netherlands, and as far as I know, also in Poland. Um, so far, um, these initiatives, uh, in terms of concrete propos proposals, have not led to a proposal for introducing an open-ended fair use provision, which is not surprising because all the lawmaking in that field is finally regulated by the 2001 Copyright Directive of the European Union. And in that directive, member states are bound to a close list of certain prototypes of exceptions and limitations, and a general flexible open-ended norm is not um, a possibility under that EU uh, lawmaking. Um, in terms of concrete proposals, we have now in the UK um, uh, proposals uh, concerning provisions on education, then on uh, research and private studying and copies made and provided by libraries and archives in that context. Um, another prominent example is an extra provision for data mining and a provision for uh, people with uh, disabilities. In the Netherlands, the debate so far has led to an initiative to broaden the traditional right of quotation so as to cover also user-generated content, which would be quite a remarkable move if this was going through the whole legislative process because user-generated content as such is not in the list um, of the European Union Copyright Directive, so this would really be a, an extensive interpretation of the right of quotation. Um, further discussion in the Netherlands concerns uh, an exemption of uh, indexing and providing search results on the Internet, but this has not led to a concrete proposal for legislative amendments. Um, with regard to the evidence that is used in these processes, well, um, when you consult the Hargreaves report in the UK, um, you find that their overview of um, empirical studies concerning copyright is quite um, um, discouraging because they say there is next to none um, empirical evidence that could be used in the area of copyright. I heard from um, Christian Hanke yesterday that this is not uh, necessarily true. There is some evidence also in the area of copyright, but it seems that these processes in the European Union and in those member states I mentioned are primarily based then on submissions by interested parties. So basically you get a broad stakeholder consultation. Um, you see um, the outcome of these consultations quite clearly in Ireland where the Review Copyright Committee finally concluded that on the basis of those submissions they cannot decide on whether or not fair use um, could be a good idea. So they said, well, um, uh, these submissions don't give sufficient evidence for one or the other side. So um, the review committee finally contented itself with uh, drafting a fair use provision but leaving it to the further legislative process to decide on whether or not such a provision should be implemented. The Netherlands is an exception in the sense that the Ministry of Economy set out to um, um, establish further evidence, and we have heard from Joost Port uh, the results of that study. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, this is a very promising first step, but when you read the study, you see that it is predominantly anecdotal evidence and case law and interviews uh, that have been conducted in Israel, but it's not an empirical study in the sense of um, a hardline um, data-based 
study with empirical evidence because this evidence, as Joost already pointed out, is uh, not available also because in countries like Israel and Singapore and Korea where fair use regimes have been implemented, there is not a zero uh, point for measuring the result of such legislation. Um, so on the basis of these experiences, uh, what is my wish list? What, what kind of empirical studies would we really need? Well, um, it would be wonderful to have an empirical study that really deals with the economic effects of flexible limitations and exceptions at this abstract level. So not breaking it down to some concrete case, which economists most of the time tend to do, which I fully understand. I mean, if you want to operationalize the whole uh, research process, it's good to focus on particular types of use. But I fear that if you get an empirical evidence concerning a particular type of use in the further legislative process, people would say, okay, we now know about this specific type, so let's have a specific exception. And this is something different from an open-ended fair use system. So in that sense, I also have some doubts whether um, with empirical sciences you always reach results that would support this um, need for flexible lawmaking that is strongly felt at least in legal circles. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I will talk a little bit about copyright reform in Chile and the use of right in the context of Latin America. Um, let me tell you first that in general, we can say that Latin American countries do not take any advantage of the flexibilities provided by the international law on copyright. We have basically two set of countries. Some countries, like Colombia or Peru, uh, have the approach of, have, they have a, a, um, a list of copyright exception, but there are but because their regulation was adopted in the 90s, they were very scared about the, the, the effect of internet and digitalization of content. As a result, they adopted two policy measures that diminished the actual scope of the exceptions. The first one was to grant it comprehensive protection to economic and exclusive right. And therefore, they don't have a list of exclusive right, but any potential use of copyrighted material is protected by law as an exclusive right of right holders. And additionally to that, because they were scared about that the copyright exception designed by, for the analog environment uh, were um, um, not suitable for a digital environment, they incorporated into their domestic law the three-step test. And therefore, um, the usage of an actual exception can be challenged in court because it doesn't satisfy the three-step test into domestic court. This reduced enormous, enormously the scope of copyright exception in those countries. Other set of countries, countries that adopted regulation before the 90s, like, uh, like Brazil, Argentina, or Chile, uh, have a very short, extremely short list of copyright exception. This produced several efforts. First, uh, several opportunities for satisfying public interest needs are not satisfied. And at the same time, because those countries uh, criminalize and punish not only of commercial uh, exploitation of wars, but also non-commercial or non-profit, non-for-profit infringement, most of the criminal pressure is going uh, against librarians, museums, archives, and schools and universities. Uh, this was the situation in Chile until 2010. In 2010, we uh, got a copyright reform. This copyright reform was pulled because of the free trade agreement we signed with the U.S., and therefore it includes several provisions related to a, a, a regime of, for internet service provider, uh, improvements in the procedures of enforcement, but at the same time, we have the, cha we have the chance to incorporate a modern regime on copyright exceptions and limitations. We didn't have uh, proper exceptions at that time. What can I say about those uh, exceptions? Well, some of them were uh, adopted in, into domestic law because they were available in international law, quotation, for example. Other of them were uh, drafted based on the experience of comparative law. Most of the, pro pro the provisions on uh, reverse engineering of software, for example, were drafted following the European Union law and the U.S. case law. There were also some provisions, for example, the exceptions related to people with disabilities that were drafted thinking in particular cases in the Chilean society, a specific libraries or centers of research that provide access to people with disabilities but didn't have any legal framework to protect those activities. And there is a 
four group of sections that were based on, um, I wouldn't say empirical, uh, empirical, uh, empirical studies, but some factual data that it could be relevant. Among those exceptions, I will uh, highlight the exceptions for uh, libraries, museums, and archives. Let me tell you some, something about, about that. Until 2010, there was no exception at all for any of those institutions in the Chilean law. Uh, however, we have a country with 17 million people living in my country. 98% of them uh, is the literary right. It's a middle-income country. And the main language spoken in the country is Spanish. This country in particular, Chile, like all the Latin American countries, are mainly importer of books. Only 3% of the market of books in the world is from Latin America. And in fact, when you, you identify where those countries buy books, you can find that the relation is that for every single dollar that is paying, uh, um, spent in Latin America buying books, Latin America buy $50 in Spain. So the relation is 1 to 50. In the case of the U.S. market, the relation is one to three. For every single dollar spent by Latin America, for every single dollar spent by the U.S. in buying books in Latin America, Latin America spent three dollars buying books. So we are mainly exporter countries. It doesn't mean that we don't have domestic capabilities in printing. We have, but those capabilities are very limited. Three percent of the total production in the world. Uh, usually, printing when you print the books in Latin America. The printing is from 500 to 800 copies. And usually, only less than 10% of the books get a second printing. So, in addition to those limited capabilities and our reliance on, export, on, on, import, on importations, we have a very expensive market for books, in relative terms and in absolute terms. Just to give you some examples. Buying a paperback book that in the U.S. can cost $10, in Chile can cost $40, in Portugal, in Brazil can cost $60. So they are very expensive in absolute terms, but also in relative terms, keep in mind that the GDP in Chile is one-third of the GDP in the U.S. Therefore, to, to make it clear, uh, if you take in, in contact, if you count the average income of an uh, American citizen, you can buy a book with, with just one hour of work. You may need a whole day of work to buy the same book in Chile and two days of work to buy the same book in Brazil. So this created a serious gap in the access to content, particularly in libraries, universities, museums, and archives, as I mentioned. Uh, and during the copyright reform, there was agreement on that point. It was not only an agreement between universities and libraries. In fact, Domestic producer of book, the, the domestic uh, industry of publishing was also in agreement, and there was a pro proposal, uh, agreed with them, to push for copyright exceptions and limitations to grant access to content to uh, users. Ultimately, it means that today we have in the copyright, because of the copyright reform, a specific exception that allows preserving books, replacing books, digitalizing and making available copyright material into the facilities of libraries, and the translation of material. They may not be enough, but certainly it means a significant progress for, for, for the Chilean society. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I'm Jennifer Urban. Um, I'm from Berkeley Law, and um, I'm in the completely unenvi unenviable position of talking about the U.S., which um, I think many people in this room um, know very well, um, uh, either because you are um, from the U.S. region or because U.S. copyright policy uh, tends to have such an impact around the world that it is a, it is a set of policies that um, are confronted by people um, in, in most regions in the world. Um, so I'll be pretty brief on um, what's going on, I'm assuming that it's something that people mostly know about, um, and then talk a little bit about what I think about evidence. Um, the, um, 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 the U.S. Copyright Office, um, with our new registrar, a register, excuse me, Maria Palanti, um, has undertaken a, a major 
project to consider a variety of issues in copyright to um, consider updating it for the digital age. Um, it's sometimes at, referred to at this point as the next great copyright act. And um, the, so the copyright office has been um, doing a variety of studies on orphan works, on, um, on um, artist um, music um, rights, and a number of others. Um, Congress has picked up um, some of this discussion and has been at least holding exploratory hearings, um, including last week the Judiciary Committee um, held one on um, intermediary liability and takedown. Um, and so there's quite a bit of discussion going on in traditional legislative reform right now. Um, I don't think anybody thinks that it's going to um, be a very quick process. Uh, the Copyright Office is still bringing in a lot of um, materials and evidence, um, and Congress has many other things to think about, but it's certainly something um, that is open for discussion. I did want to mention that simultaneous with considering policy concerns, um, uh, broadly outside the Copyright Office. The Copyright Office has also undertaken a major initiative on its registration processes on, on digitizing its records, which I think are actually quite important for user rights um, for everyone who uses the copyright system. Um, but if you are able to do better research, and it goes to the empirical point next, um, if you're be able to do better research with these records, as some on the last panel mentioned, I think it will make a difference. So um, that, um, that initiative actually is, a, is an ongoing sort of reform effort that I think um, might be important here. Um, the last bit, again, with which I think people are mostly familiar, as far as um, as far as uh, traditional reform goes, is that there's been a lot of copyright activity in Congress um, in the last few years, but much of it has actually. Um, um, not been um, the kind of reform that is considering directly user rights. It is generally considering something, uh, enforcement or similar questions, and those who are interested in flexibility or user rights um, are faced with using evidence in a more defensive posture, um, and those who are looking for more enforcement are faced with using evidence in a more proactive um, posture. Um, as Jeremy, um, um, as Jeremy also said about Canada, I wanted to say a word about the fact that the United States being a common law country and also a country with a very executive a very active executive branch um, actually accomplishes reform um, outside of um, traditional legislative reform um, very actively and in a variety of ways. Uh, Jeremy talked about courts and cases, and that's very important in the U.S. Um, and not only do we have a common law, uh, well, a quasi-common law system, but we also have fair use um, in place, which means the courts remain a core form for copyright reform or just general change today. Um, again, many people are probably familiar with a lot of what's going on, um, but um, I would commend everyone, um, especially to um, the, the set of cases around books and um, library and uh, academic uses of materials, the Hathi Trust case, the Georgia State case, the Google Book Search case, those on secondary liability, the Viacom versus YouTube case, um, the Oracle versus Google case, the tests of cable vision um, as far as um, what kinds of secondary markets can develop, and a variety of others because all of those cases are creating some form of reform um, in the decisions that they are making. Also for sale with Kurt Sang and Monsanto. Um, and um, as Jeremy also noted, academic scholarship can be very relevant um, in, these, um, in each of these fora, um, both in um, going into Congress and having academics testify, um, um, but also more directly. So one of the hearings that's been held on the Hill focused directly on the Copyright Principles Project um, that was run by Pam Samuelson at Berkeley and had uh, many voices, um, or to, you know, a group of voices together to think about principles. Um, uh, in the court cases, um, uh, amicus briefs have been picked up a few times, uh, more than a few times, actually. Um, in the argument um, in the Google Book Search case 
on Monday um, amicus briefs by academics about academic work using copyrighted works um, were very central to the oral argument. So um, there's certainly place for um, empirical and other academic work. I wanted to say a brief word also about reform initiatives outside of the courts and, and Congress in the executive branch. Um, so again, everybody in the room is very, I think, familiar um, with trade agreements um, and how those are um, being used um, in reform around the world. Um, we, of course, have had um, recently for a few years an IP czar, to use the loose term, um, in the administration, um, which has resulted, I think, in um, a dialogue um, between the executive and between Congress um, and with the Copyright Office um, that all feeds together into um, reform. But I also wanted to mention things that individual agencies are doing. Um, so um, the um, open access policy that was decided for um, scientific articles um, being funded by NIH and a host of other agency a uh, host of other agencies, I think is very important. It's a critical reform or an essential reform. Um, I want to give the very um, uh, modest Mike Carroll, who's uh, moderating our panel, um, the recognition for a lot of work that he did um, on, on this reform, which ties again to the point that academic research or evidence I think can be very helpful um, to the executive branch as well as it is considering these. And the Patent and Trademark Office's um, recent decision that the longstanding practice of using articles in file wrappers and in prosecution um, was that they took that to be a fair use. So those are two examples um, of, of reform efforts in a change in policy um, that are not in a traditional Congress. Um, so evidence. Um, most of us are familiar with um, the, and it was discussed on the last panel and some today, on a lot of the evidence that is um, put forth in these discussions in the United States in any of these fora. Um, we have trade um, industry um, numbers um, and modeling for how uh, copyright um, reforms might affect or how the present state of copyright law might affect various um, uh, players, generally large industrial players. We have some economic impact studies and we have some response um, from users. Um, 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 all of this um, has its challenges, um, as everyone has stated already. I had a few ideas um, and examples of things that I think would be helpful. Um, um, one is to look at um, not just whether you get more academic activity um, directly, but to try a second um, layer, which is perhaps not as satisfactory, um, but might be illuminating, which is to look at use of statistics of resources um, and to look at how materials, uh, cultural materials and other materials are propagating um, through society and how they're being used. Now, um, as, um, as um, Joost said, and I absolutely agree, the best case scenario um, for really studying this would be um, to study it before and after an experimental state, a natural experimental state occurs, um, so that you have a policy change and you are able then to see what happens. And this isn't just for user statistics, this would be for anything. It's a rare opportunity, um, both because it's a, that policy change has to happen um, and it's hard to get right, and also because of the timing is so important. You need a baseline in place. You need to have already studied it when the policy takes a place in order to um, study it again, but I agree that would be helpful. The next best case, I think, um, would be use of open resources or resources that are governed by flexible limitations and exceptions versus other resources. Um, challenges here are comparing apples to apples, um, both the resource and all of the complexities of the different models under which they're distributed, the complexities of the user groups, as many have pointed out. They're often producers and users of cultural materials. Um, but this is something that I think um, can be fruitful and could be fruitful if done um, more widely. Non-comparative um, op option that is still useful um, would be a look at um, open, open use of open resources um, and behaviors where things have long been assumed, but we didn't actually know if the policy was in place. So this is the Patent and Trademark Office example where everybody was using um, the materials in this way because you had to in order to prosecute a patent, um, but we didn't know what the policy was. Those might be useful um, case studies to consider. <coughs> 
Um, as far as traditional empirics are concerned, um, quantitative numbers. Um, I'm presently working with Joe Karaganis at the American Assembly, and we are gathering a host of other people, Neva Alconcorin um, at Haifa and others, um, to study takedown um, through direct empirical um, research. Um, distribution and use empirics, I think, are also very much needed, um, both in how things are distributed and priced and then how they're used. Enormous challenges with these kinds of studies is getting the data because most of it sits with private um, actors and they, um, publishers or Amazon may not um, be um, interested in handing it over. Same with takedown. An enormous issue that we're running into with takedown is actually dealing with the data when we get it. Um, when you talk about automated takedown processes, bot-based takedown processes, you're drowning in data. Tens of millions of notices and more. And figuring out how to fairly um, look at those is a, is a difficult problem, but I think important research. Um, best practice methodologies and other careful qualitative work have a lot to tell us. Big challenges here, as have already been discussed, are generalizability and also cost. Um, and I would like to encourage people to think about learning from other methodologies and fields. So the privacy field has been learning a great deal recently and other fields of, um, uh, from decisional work and behavioral economics. And this might be something that would be fruitful. Um, usability and usage studies more generally that often just look at systems. Um, but if we look at um, how people interact with culturally produced material, cultural production, um, that may be fruitful. And there's a lot of research and a lot of methodology out there. Um, um, Martin, um, oh no, um, it was actually, um, I think it was Rebecca mentioned Silicon Valley and going to San Francisco. Um, I have on my list industrial research. Annalise Saxinian um, from the Information School at Berkeley wrote a very well-known book in our world called Regional Advantage, um, which is about trade secret uh, law and um, employee um, non-competition agreements and what that means in Silicon Valley. I think there could be a tr tremendous benefit to um, looking at that in um, terms of intellectual property as well. And then the last little, uh, the last bit that I will say, which is a little bit more out there, um, is that um, evidence from evidence from other worlds that shows by analogy um, how policy is happening I think can be very important. And let me give you one um, example going back to the Google Books oral argument earlier this week. Um, and that is about how limitations and exceptions are used in practice. So an oral argument in the Google Books case um, this um, um, earlier in the week uh, um, a brief um, by um, some academic lawyers on behalf of humanities scholars who use the Google Books corpus in order to study um, changes in society over time by using large quantitative studies on the text was very interesting and important um, in the discussion of whether or not this is the kind, the kinds of questions of the case, which are about fair use and copyrightability, um, uh, have relevance in um, uh, it, whether how things are used um, have relevance to that legal question. So I think that considering evidence of from other fields is also really important. Thanks very much. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'll be as quick as possible and probably quicker than the other ones because I'm the last and you're already tired. So let's go. Um, Whatever has moved the recent change in Brazil, and there have been a few, it has not been the economic discourse. It has been mostly the social and political pressure, and mostly the social adequacy of copyright and its possible positive or negative effects in all society as a whole. Although the argument, the economic argument has been brought about, uh, data has not been brought about. So basically they're using economic arguments without data. <laughs> Basically, it's not an economic argument. It's a political and social argument. So um, that's basically what's being led. Uh, the banner has been, um, however, there have been a few studies on cultural equipments, cultural access to movie theaters, attendance to movies, theaters, books, and so on, buying books, and so on. So indirectly, yes, it does affect the, the cultural, the copyright industry as a whole, but has been taken not as a study on the copyright industry, but as a study on cultural equipment, its distribution or its concentration, which is the result. The end result found a high concentration 
of equipment like theaters, movie theaters, libraries, um, bookstores, and so on in very small cities. And within the cities in specific areas, which of course are the richest areas, therefore that's where they are there. And that has also shown that most of the people, most of the country does not have access to their work, whether because the equipment's not there, so they could not go to the movie or the theater anyway, or because even if there is equipment, the works don't get there, the real works that people don't want to see don't get there, or they take a long time. Let's say a movie is released in Rio and Sao Paulo in Brasilia, but by the time it gets to other cities, it's already old and everyone has seen it online already, so it really doesn't do much in that sense, so that's one of the conclusions. However, the, the other studies that have been on the copyright industries, they have all been done by the industry themselves with data provided by themselves that haven't been made available for questioning. Therefore, we all have, okay, this is the conclusion, this is what we have, this is how it works, therefore you should follow this or that. Uh, we have been able to, within those studies, to catch a few things that are not said and therefore would support the limitations argument. But however, we do not have access to the whole data and to tell the truth, I don't really trust the data that has been put forward by the industry without being checked out for any reason. So this is the state where it is now. However, there have been, in July, there have been a couple of changes which are had passed into law an amendment to copyright law on a collective management societies. And it, within that, they are going to be obliged to report every data. All the data is going to be public and will have to be made available. Which means it's going to implement now, the, it will come into effect in December, which means next year will be the first year where the data will have to be reported and the year after then we're going to start having some more official data on um, based on the music industry and how that, uh, that's affected, how, how much is distributed, how much started from who, who pays what, where, and so on. But that will be next year, and that will be available for everyone. It is in the law, it's public, available, free access to everyone uh, from everywhere. So we're going to start to be able to actually have access to that and discuss on days of that. Um, there's not a real single, as, as far as I know, a single work on copyright limitations, economics of copyright limitations in Brazil. Not a single one. So we basically take whatever is left from the other. Okay, that might apply for limitations here and there, and that's all we can do on that. So I'm really hoping the project goes, goes on in order for us to have the basic data there. And the second problem is that to convince the economists, colleagues, economists, oh, listen, it's worth doing it, all oh, everyone, oh, it's very hard, there's no methodology, there's no other study on it, and blah, blah, blah. But now I'm meeting a few economists here, and I will say, see, they are doing it, why can't we do it here, and so on, and on, and hopefully to convince them, to attract them to the copyright field. And I've been trying to do that, actually, inviting them for movie parties or release and other stuff like that, so maybe they'll be convinced that that's a good field, people are nice, they're for, they should be studying that instead of being studying industrial economics and so on. <laughs> but um, that's a way of persuasion and let's see if that will work. Um, we, uh, the amendment on limitations are about to come up, although we've been promised that many times. At this time, I don't think the presidency can postpone it for that long and uh, the, the, the talks on the political arena is that of the project is that they will expand substantially the limitations and that will include an open clause or general clause as we call it and I'm pretty sure that in the discussion that will be a huge point on the economic side, however, without any study on it, which means I will grab all the studies I get, I can have access to here and bring it there, so to, in order to discuss that. So this is the new situ the situation in Brazil. So far, the, ar the leading argument there has been the social impact of the restrictions, not how much that economically affects the industry and so on and on and on. But I'll just to finish up. Um, I, th I would add another concern from what you said. Uh, I think um, besides the very strict economic study, if we also take a stance on analyzing how much 
of the use of how much a new work depends on the use of prior works would also be very helpful in order to see how much of the limitations are important and which limitations are important on that. Especially if we take a stance where uh, a basic one where we know that anyone that will be a writer must before be a reader, anyone that wants to be a filmmaker must be a film buff before, and how does that affect the whole thing. My own position is that we have a very wrong, well, I mean, I, almost the whole world has a very wrong stake on copyright because we start talking about protection before talking about access and there is no reason for copyright if there is no access before because there will be no author, there will be no works and there will be no public because you only become a movie goer or a theater goer or a reader if you have before been exposed to it and developed the desire for that sort of uh, experience. That's it. Great. Um, so I do know that the audience is uh, waiting to get in. I, I do want to ask for a quick reaction to this proposition. Um, one of the things that we, that we were hearing there is that the discourse around limitations and exceptions can fall into roughly one of three kinds of buckets. So the, the least generous might be the loophole, that it's merely a harmless provision of the law that it permits a use um, that, that doesn't really matter anyway. And so that's sort of, um, the, the to it's almost like a toleration. It's just a tolerated use. Um, the, the, the flip side is the more normative uh, version that we were hearing from Canada, that it's a user's right. That is, that without, there's a, a normative commitment to the use with or without the economic evidence. Uh, it's, not, it's not an empirical question about whether the use should be permitted, it's a user's right. But then there might be a middle space in which the economic evidence might actually be important to decide whether the use is Im important or how to value the use um, on, from an economic perspective. And here I think the, the discourse that, that this project is at least uh, hoping to uh, uh, put out there is the idea that a limitation or exception to the copyright owner's right is an enabling provision. It enables people to do things they would not otherwise do. And one way to think about the enablement is not just the individual who can now access the work, but economically you can invest in the use of the work because it is now legal to make. Because one of the things we were hearing is that the targets of enforcement often are institutions that need to comply with the law. We know that we have a number of individuals in the society who disregard the law and therefore the limitation and exception is irrelevant to their behavior. But the, be the, the behaviors that m where the law matters, the libraries, the educational institutions, the archives, there the presence or absence of the limitation really does have enabling or disabling um, uh, features. And as we heard the, st the story from Malaysia, the absence of limitations and exceptions has measurable impacts. So within the discourse of enabling provisions, I'm wondering are there particular kinds of enablement that you think the law might focus its energy on encouraging and how economic analysis might help in sort of identifying that kind, as you were saying, Jeremy, that the positive impacts of, the, of these provisions rather than merely the lack of negative impacts from a copyright owner perspective. So I throw it out there. Whoever wants to grab it, grab it. I think I would like to leave it to our international partners to talk about the kinds of reforms, but um, I would um, make another um, pitch, although understanding it can't always happen, um, for the natural experiments idea. Um, uh, if we could identify spaces or places and time where um, um, some measurable or quantifiable, describable legal certainty, um, uh, value of legal cer certainty changes. It either becomes more uncertain or um, more uncertain or less uncertain, more certain for institutional users like libraries and archives or others who need to be law-abiding 
um, in an area that touches on flexibility, and we are able to um, do a study that uh, has a baseline and then, and, and then sees um, what the effect has been on them, I think that could be quite beneficial. One thing, just I think it's more a side thing, but uh, one thing I've noticed on the discourse, I noticed, noticed early and I heard I think two or three times on, on the table here, is that, oh, this is, this is common law, this is civil law, and um, I will make a provocation. Uh, I think this is way more of a myth than a reality. And I can see that in a large country like Brazil, the difference between the state court's decisions are much bigger than between Brazil higher court and other countries. Just to tell you, just one example. I'm sure the difference in Europe too between countries that are civil law traditions are way more different than necessarily between civil law tradition and common law countries. So there is behind that in, in um, civil law tradition countries the idea that economic studies are not the most important or they are not that valuable in guiding the political discussion, while, while instead the social discourse, fundamental rights become much more important. However, I see the, the difference, just to be very short, the difference is just a question of more or less openness to interpreting the text, because the text doesn't pre-exist. It will exist only after interpretation, and the civil law countries have been moving uh, way stronger towards more openness and than was before, so I think this is more of a myth. Whenever we talk about, about it, I think we just should concern about that, because that could be one of the reasons why economic studies are not so popular or demanded for in civil or traditional countries. Uh, Martin and then Jeremy. Yeah, answering to <clears throat> that question, I think um, a particularly rewarding area of research um, is the question in how far a flexible open norm provides a, a more solid basis for new business models and uh, the development of new, let's say, internet industries. Um, I, I have a feeling from looking at case law and so on that in countries where you have a fair use provision, a newcomer in the marketplace always has a good argument in saying, well, I think this is something that is uh, a legitimate kind of use and I will try to defend it as a fair use. Whereas in a system where you don't have such an opening clause, um, you just check the list of um, traditional exceptions. You don't find a case that really fits um, the kind of use that you are trying to make and that's basically end of the story. So basically you are discouraged as a newcomer with a with an innovative new business model um, because you don't find a match in the list of closed exceptions. So in that sense, um, this would be very interesting and I see this also in the debate in Europe that lawmakers are particularly um, looking for this kind of evidence. If you can make the argument that this is something that fosters innovation and uh, new businesses, then you have a very strong argument for legislative reform. And it's also my feeling that this is something that uh, economists could really show because it is, to my humble understanding, this is an economic category and um, easier to um, operationalize than a more abstract question of whether or not it is good to have it as a user interest or a user right or something. Just want to pick up on um, the point that you mentioned about the phrase user rights and point out that in Canada it's still very much an instrumental right um, and the scope of that right will be delineated in large part by among other things economic evidence of the impact of, of that right and it's sort of interesting that in Canada we don't have the user's right bolstered by uh, jurisprudence or values around freedom of expression in the same way uh, that that happens in the United States. So it's somewhat ironic that Canada's adopted the discourse of the user's right without that sort of constitutional impetus around um, freedom of expression, for example. Your second point was also a very good one, and I'll give you an, uh, about enablement and the, the value of a, a limitation, exception, or a user's right as an enabling provision. I'll give you an example of a new provision enacted in Canada's Copyright Modernization Act of 2012. It's uh, section 29.21. And it provides a user's right 
to use another work for the purpose of non-commercial user-generated content. It's a specific exception for user-generated content, which is fascinating. It's the only one I know of in the world. Um, now, there's some, some caveats. It has to be for non-commercial purposes, and you have to mention the source and so on. But what's quite interesting is that I think that's, that specific exception doesn't really serve much function on its own because people were unlikely uh, to be sued for non-commercial user-generated content. But what that does is it enables providers of user-generated content to significantly reduce their liability risk for secondary infringement because the primary act is now clearly not infringing uh, in, in the circumstances. Just the final point I mentioned about that provision is that one of the conditions you need to fulfill is demonstrate that there's no substantial adverse impact financial or otherwise, from your use in the user-generated content. Um, and, and that's something that economic uh, evidence would, would greatly um, guide. Great. Rebecca? So on the Wait, Rebecca and then Albert. So on the topic of national experiments, I think Jeremy's example is a, a really useful one of something that is achieving its actual aim. In Australia, we experimented with flexibility a little in 2006 as part of some limited reforms in response to the Australia-US Free Trade Agreement, where we introduced a new flexible exception just for certain cultural institutions, uh, and they were allowed to, to make certain uses of works as long as those uses complied with the three-step test. So that was the three-step test was actually imported directly into the national legislation. So any librarian or person.